start with a song this morning. We're going to sing Sanctuary if everybody will stand up. <laughs> morning everybody uh, I just have one announcement this morning uh, the state convention for the uh, past few years have been putting on a men's and boys retreat and as far as we know it is still going on and uh, we're attempting to send a group uh, this year uh, you register online but you don't have to pay until you get there um, I don't have all the information on it, um, but in case it gets canceled or whatever, uh, that's why you don't have to pay till you get there. Um, so, but it's September 12th, I believe, 12th and the 13th, is it? That's a Friday, Saturday. I don't know, it's a Friday, Saturday. Um, it's at Camp Caesar in Cohen. Uh, Jonathan will have more information on that. Um, but if you, just throwing that out there, if you're interested in going, get with Jonathan or myself. Um, and we'll get the details out. Um, but that's the announcement I have. Anybody else have any announcements? Okay. Um, if not, we'll go into a time of prayer. Uh, remember Debbie Ritchie. Um, talk to Chris. Um, he seems to think she could possibly come home tomorrow. Um, everything's going well. Debbie's in good spirits. Um, remember Karen Summers and uh, Sharon Hudson, Kelly Hudson, and Marley. Remember all three of those. Um, Marley's got some things going on. Uh, Kelly's having surgery tomorrow, I think is what Jim said. And uh, then remember Sharon with everything she's got going on. Uh, does anybody else have any prayer requests? Absolutely. So like I told you earlier, it's good to see you this morning. Glad, glad you're back. Wednesday. Absolutely. I knew that. Um, and also, let's mention this uh, the first service today. Uh, Tim Wilson, remember his mother, she fell yesterday evening. Um, and they're possibly taking her for x-rays this morning. Fell and broke his arm. Was he? Okay, just, just being a boy. <laughs> Any more prayer requests? more all right i'll take these needs to the lord father again we come to you this morning lord we just 
thank you that we're able to be here in your house, Lord, and worship you. And we just ask that you be with all these prayer requests that's been lifted up to you, Lord. You know the needs. You know what's going on, Lord. And we know we have faith in you that you still are the ultimate healer, Lord. And we just ask that you be with each and every one of these hearts, Lord, that through their prayer and through our prayer, Lord, that their pain will be eased, their worries will be eased with the trust in you, Lord. We know you are the ultimate. In your name we pray, amen. some special music. Sometimes I still try to take control Cause I get scared when I can't see the end And all you want from me is to let go
Good morning again. Uh, before we get started, uh, just want to look back in the back there and say, hi, Kevin. Um, and I know I'm not talking to myself. It was for Gene's son there, giving a shout out. He, he likes to watch, so uh, letting him know that we appreciate it. Um, and also, uh, I did this. I wasn't going to do this after the first service. I was going to wait until this service, but I, I went ahead and did it after the first, so I'll do it again. Um, proud dad moment. Uh, Isaiah, he's like, when I get older, I'm going to try out for American Idol. <laughs> I said, all right. Dude, I'm preaching in a couple of weeks. Won't you sing at church? No, no, I ain't singing at church. You gonna sing for American Idol? Why don't you, you sing at church? Good practice. No, 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 I ain't singing. Okay, Bella, you wanna sing at church? Yeah, <laughs> sing. She loves to sing, right? And so that's that's the proud dad moment that she sang. Um, and it's not that she sang, because like I said, she loves to sing. It's that she sang and the song she sang because like i said bella loves to sing she sings all the time but she's in a, a season of her life where the songs and I, i'm not this is no joke this is true the songs she likes to sing are, are mostly about drinking um and uh, some of y'all's like you let your six-year-old drink well i'm raising her baptist it's, it is um I'm glad you all laughed at that. I didn't get too many laughs at that first service. I think I got kind of mad. So I told him, if that being a that Baptist joke offended anybody, uh, I don't see this happening. But if anybody ever builds a statue of me in my hometown, you have my permission to tear it down if I offended you. Um, I'm fine with it. It's okay. All right. So I call this sermon the three R's. Um, the, the three R's, the three R's of Christianity, um, this is what I perceived as the three R's of Christianity. And the pastor was actually here the first service, and he didn't critique me afterwards. So maybe what I said was right. I don't know. Um, anyways, the three R's, and I hope this makes sense to you all, because just because it makes sense to me doesn't mean it makes sense. Um, all right, so... Oh, yeah, and, and like I told him in the first service, I have no notes up here, and y'all know that I've done this for a few years now. This is technically what normally would be Youth Sunday. We'd have the youth up here doing skits, and then we'd have a bunch of food afterwards, and the Rona's like, none of that's happening this year. So I was like, okay. Uh, so I'm using slides for the first time, and I'll look back at the slides while I'm talking to y'all because... Like I said, I have no notes, and I get sidetracked, and a lot of times I forget what I'm talking about. Uh, but the first R is relationship. Relationship, all right? Christianity starts with a relationship, all right? Christianity used to be putting blood on the door on the Sabbath and all kinds of other stuff you had to do. Well, when Jesus died on the cross, it became a relationship with Christ. The first R is relationship because in order to be a Christian, to follow God, you have to have a relationship with him. Correct? Y'all got me? We good so far? All right. Boom. Here's the definition of relationship in case anybody in here doesn't understand that. The way in which two or more objects, concepts, or people are connected. All right, two or more, that's the definition. Your relationship with God is not more. It's two, you and God. Um, so state of connection, that's your relationship. What is your state of connection with Christ? Next slide. Speaking of which, relationships, all right? We'll do anything for a relationship, right? We have to have a relationship. Um, I told this story first service, so I'll tell it again. Um, last week, I didn't. I was at the first service last week. I wasn't at the second. So if y'all were here last week, um, I don't, I, during the first service, Tim was talking about how if anything good came from COVID, it was that people's reflecting on their relationship with God. Um, and, and why I agree with that 100%, me personally, I think the best thing that the Rona ever did for us was keep non-essential drivers off the road for a period of time. Because as a professional steering wheel holder myself, I'm not a truck driver, I'm a professional steering wheel holder. Um, there was a period of time 
when it was amazing because there was not a lot of traffic on the road. It was great. Um, and I'm coming back from one of my runs. Um, I believe I was up 79, up Morgantown area, coming back. Uh, this was late April. Um, and wasn't a lot of traffic on the road, going north or coming back down south. So, I mean, it was great. So that's just me looking out the windshield, had the, the radio playing. And I'm hearing songs, and I'm thinking, man, I'm a lucky man because I, I would hear songs, and it just would make me reflect on how lucky I am to have the wife that I have, okay? I, I would hear songs, and I'm like, man, I'm so lucky, right? Well, being the guy I am, Mother's Day's coming up, so I'm thinking, I'm getting all these thoughts. Uh, you know, I'm going right, to get this stuff together, and, and so I'm getting these thoughts and just what she means to me and how great of a wife she is and a mother she is. And so, of course, I don't do this while I'm driving, but, you know, I get, get my thoughts together, and, of course, I write them down and get them all nice and organized and, and, and what I want to say. Um, so here we are, and I'm, I'm reading this to her. Uh, real, real romantic guys. You know how we are with relationships. I'm reading this to her, although I don't think she really heard me over the lawnmower she was pushing at the time. <laughs> but it, you know, that got more laughs than the first one did. I appreciate that. Uh, no, <laughs> that didn't happen. I like got told the first service. I actually stole that joke from one of my favorite comedians. His name's Bob Smiley. He, uh, he does some stuff with the youth. I've heard him a couple times. He's great. And if y'all have never heard him, he's a Christian comedian. Bob Smiley's great. You can Google Tubi. He, he's great. Um, but, yeah, I know I stole that joke from him. Again, don't steal. It's one of the commandments. My mom raised me Baptist. It's okay. Um, but Matthew 6, 33, going into the relationships. All right. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything else will come to you. All right, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Look, people had questions. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? What are we going to do? Blah, blah, blah. All right, look, Jesus never denied the importance of these things. What will you drink? What will you eat? What will you wear? He never denied the importance. But he said, seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be provided for you. Relationships. Seek first the kingdom of God, and everything else will fall into place. Next slide. Trust and faith. Oh, yeah. I also said this first. I should have told you all, too. Another reason why I did slides is because this morning, I'm all over the place in the Bible. We're going to be in Romans, Proverbs, Matthew. Of course, we'll be in Luke because the pastor told me I had to. It's Luke. Um but yeah, we're going to be all over the place. So to keep y'all from flipping back and forth and everything, did the slides. Because like when I was preparing what I was going to talk about, like I got paper cut. I was flipping back and forth so much between different books. So like I'm not going to do that to y'all. So that's another reason I did slides. We'll be bouncing all over the place. Um, I, as a matter of fact, if you have Bibles and you want to follow me in your Bible, just open it up because there's a good chance I'm going to hit wherever you open your Bible to. I'm going to all over the place. Uh, but Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, all right, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and make your path straight. All right. In this particular two verses, trust and faith are synonymous. Yeah, big word, synonymous. See, back to school, I'm, I'm going to give you all some education. Synonymous, all right? <clears throat> What that means is they're the same, all right? In, these, in this, past, this particular passage right here, trust and faith are one, all right? Until we trust that the Lord, with all our hearts, we will have trouble with faith. Until you trust in the Lord with all your heart, you will struggle with faith, all right? Because if you can't, trust that the Lord has the best intentions for your heart, that he knows what's best for you. Where's your faith at? All right. Whether we understand, which happens a lot, we don't understand why things happen, when they happen. I mean, we're not programmed to understand everything. All right. 
it's going to happen. Everybody out there struggles with something different, trying to understand something. Me, not that complicated. My biggest thing, like I told first service, is why are crayons not flavored? Think about it. All right, you get done coloring a picture, you have a snack. I mean, they're non-toxic. It's not like it hurts, but you get the big pack of crayons, like the 64 ish Thanksgiving meal. I mean, think about it. I mean, y'all probably thinking crayons are, why would you eat crayons? Yeah, they're nasty because they're not flavored. If they were flavored, it'd be good, right? It's just, just something I think about. I don't know. But trust and faith, they go hand in hand. Next slide. All right, because he first loved me. All right, we love God because he first loved me. Like Carrie Beth's always talking about them old Bible school songs. We love God because he first loved us. All right, First John 4, 19. All right, basically that's what it says. We love God because he first loved us. Two stories. So uh, Riverside Church in New York is a, a baby's baptism. Baby's baptism. You heard that right. A baby's baptism. Okay. This, this guy was talking about how he was at this service, and he was like, you know what? I remember nothing about the service. He said, I, I don't remember the message. I don't remember the music. I don't remember what I was wearing. I don't remember nothing about the service. But he said, I do remember this. It came time for the baby's baptism. Baptized the baby. Poured water over his head. Then the pastor held the baby up for the congregation. He said, at that moment, everyone was rejoicing. All right. That baby had no connection to God. It's a baby. All right. Had no idea who God was, why it was there, why its head just got wet. Baby had no idea. All right. But the pastor was rejoicing. The parents of the baby was rejoicing. The congregation was rejoicing. They were rejoicing in the fact that God loved that baby and that God wanted to see that baby raised in a godly manner become a godly man that's what they were rejoicing secondly second story it's a story of, of two two parents um, and they had a son this son was their parents entire world matter of fact they only had this one child because when this child was born they both felt like they could never love another child as much as they loved this son so they just had no other kids. They had this one child. Their whole world revolved around this one child. And as so many boys do, they grew up and they become teenagers. In the teenage years, this child rebelled against his parents, started hanging out with bad influences, just being a typical teenager. Um, one day... This big hands on the 12, little hands on the 11 when we start around here. Love you, Steve. Um, <laughs> love you, Steve. I know, Delma's was out of town. You're good. <laughs> uh, but, all right, the story I was telling you. All right, <clears throat> so one day this, this, this son, he came home, 3 a.m., drunk. All right, just drunk. Came home, crashed through the door, went upstairs to his bedroom, passed out on his bed, on top of covers and everything. Well, of course, making all that noise when he came in, woke his parents up. His mom got out of bed. His dad soon followed. Uh, he, he went down to the kitchen thinking that's where this boy's mother was, sitting and crying like she normally does. And, and as he was walking down the hallway, he looked in his son's bedroom, and he noticed his wife, the boy's mother, sitting by the son's bedside, just stroking his matted hair as he laid passed out on top of the covers. He, woke, he walked in there, and he's like, what are you doing? And her words, tear-filled eyes, she looked at her husband and said, he won't let me love him while he's awake. I'm going to do it now. And he just stood there and watched his wife. And that, that sums up 
all right? God loves us, even in our darkest days. Even when we turn to sin and we reject him, he still loves us. And it may not happen when you're five years old. It may not happen when you're 35 years old. But there comes a day when you realize God does love us. And we love him because he first loved us. That's what 1 John 4, 19 is all about. All right, next slide. Running, the second R, running. <laughs> yeah, y'all. Like, I didn't get this physical video by not running, y'all. No, no. Running as a noun is the act of running. We are not talking about nouns today. No. I don't run. Matter of fact, it's, it's great because, you know, the pastor did a series a while back about running, running with the Lord, running, running. You know how, how this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Hell, and then when he starts talking about running, that's when I take a nap. Because I don't run. Like I was telling um, first service, I played football most of my life. Um, then after my sophomore year, I switched to soccer my junior and senior year of high school because I don't like to run. And I know that don't make sense to a lot of y'all. You played soccer? Yeah, no. <laughs> y'all should have seen me play soccer. Number one, my, my key position in soccer was goalie. Goalies don't run, right? That's why I played goalie. Matter of fact, I stood there, and I had a pretty good reach, and, and I, could, I was quick. I had a quick first step. But let's just say the other team scored a lot of goals because if I had to move, I wasn't getting the ball. I'd get it out of the back of the net. I did that a lot. And then secondly, when I wasn't playing goalie and I was out in the field, I had – a, uh, a certain move I made. It was great because I'd be in a position, like whether I was midfield, center field, or wherever I was at, offense, defense. I play defense a lot. Where is offense or defense? Um, and Alice BJ could contest, contest this because, you know, we play soccer together. Um, I had this move, this one special move, and it almost worked sometimes. Um, <laughs> I just close my eyes and kick. Um, sometimes it almost worked. Um, it did work once. Um, we were playing polka. It was my junior year at Riverside. And um, I was actually playing defense. And, and polka was worse than we were. And um, so, like, when I say I was playing defense, anybody knows anything about soccer? Defense, you're back towards your goal, blah, blah, blah. No. Poker was so bad, our defense was at midfield because everybody got behind us because, like I said, they were worse than we were. So me and the other guys playing defense, we, we just kept pushing up and pushing up. And one of the midfielders had the ball, and he had, like, two people around him, and I was wide open. Next thing I know, he passes the ball back to me. Oh, yeah. Close my eyes, step up, boom. When I open my eyes, I see the ball going right past the goalie's hand. <laughs> I scored a goal, right? So, which I still, to this day, hold a state record my set my junior year of goal percentage in a season. One shot, one goal. That's 100%. <laughs> uh, but anyway, and it's a good thing I scored that goal because if I wouldn't have scored that goal, we would have won that game 12-3 to 3 instead of 13-3. to 3. So it's a good thing. Like I said, poker was bad. Uh, but anyways, I'm not talking about that running. I'm talking about the adjective of running, okay? Yeah, see, I told you I was going to learn y'all some stuff today. Nouns, adjectives, we're talking about all kinds of stuff. Uh, anyways, the definition, the adjective definition of running is continuous or reoccurring over a long period of time. What I'm talking about running is running and running conversations with Christ every day, all right? Running conversations with Christ every day day from the time your feet hit the floor till the time your head hits the pillow at night or if you're Rodney and work shift work it could be from the time your feet hit the floor at night till the time your head hits the pillow in the morning whichever way it goes anyways 
running in conversations with Christ every day. Next slide. All right, boom. Prayer. That's what I'm talking about. Running. Con Anybody ever here had a running conversation? I know some of y'all men are married, and you know what it's like being with somebody that don't shut up. Um, but if nobody in here has ever experienced a running conversation, call my house, and I will let you talk to Bella. You will experience a running conversation, I promise you. Like, I'll get home from work. We use the back door to the house because we park in front of the garage. So I'll walk in the back door, which leads into the kitchen, take my boots off. Well, here she comes running through the house. Daddy. So I start hearing about her day. Three hours later, when I'm ready to go to bed, I might know three things she did that day because she's easily distracted. Um, but Matthew 6, 5 through 8, we're talking about prayer, okay? Prayer can do a lot of things, all right? Prayer can heal. Prayer can give you peace. You can do a lot of things in prayer. The one thing you cannot do in prayer is you cannot impress God, okay? So don't try to impress God when you pray because the Bible tells you it can't happen. You're not going to do it. Jesus spoke about people in this passage trying to impress God with their words, their lengthy prayer. All right. He simply told his disciples, when you pray, pray in solitude and simplicity. All right. Prayer is best done when you are surrounded and obedient to God. Uh, and then Solomon in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 5, 1, 2, Solomon is talking about these lengthy prayers and how people are just on and on and rambling and all this stuff. And he's talking about people who, who forget who they are, forget what they're doing, and forget who God is when they're praying. All right. And then the big mistake in prayer, all right, right there, is praying in routine. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to have a prayer routine. It's not. Um, it's not at all. If you pray before you go to bed, that's fine. Okay? But when you pray, if, if, if say, we'll just use that as an example, because Isaiah does. Isaiah prays every night before he goes to bed. Okay? Are you praying out of routine because it's what you do? Or is that prayer full of intent? Okay? When you have a running conversation with God from sun up to sun down, you're praying out of intent. Now, I, I get it. There's, there's special things come up during the day where you're like, boom, stop and pray. I get it. Um, but purpose and intention, that's, that's what prayer is. Um, the thing is, if you talk too much, you can't listen. That's what Solomon's trying to get across. If you talk too much, you can't listen. Remember, when you pray, you can talk to God and you can listen to God, but you cannot impress God. Slide. Predictable prayer. Anybody in here ever have a predictable prayer? Y'all remember Sunday services before the Rona happened? And we would take up offering? We would pass the plate, and there would be this one individual that would come up here very, usually he's very well dressed. He'd come up here, and he would pray over the offering. All right. Y'all ever listen to him pray over the offering? He says the same thing every week. Huh, that's me, this guy right here. And again, <laughs> I learned from the best. <laughs> Oops, sorry. I learned from the best. Old Ralph T. Carter. Right at my papa, he would be the one to pray over the offering, and same prayer every week. Right, me, I'm predictable in prayer. I come up here to pray over the offering. You know what I'm gonna say. All right, doesn't mean I'm right. No. All right. So when you pray, 
remember this, all right? Matthew 6, 9 through 13, all right? What is that? It's the Lord's Prayer. That is our example Jesus gave us for prayer. I kind of broke it down. Hopefully it makes sense. He starts off, hallowed be your name, all right? You are the one. You are it. Hallowed be your name. Then he goes on to the uh, importance of seeking and surrender, okay? Your will be done. That's the importance of seeking and surrender. Not what I want, what you want. <coughs> then personal request. All right. How many of y'all pray for a personal request? Oh, I think I'm going to pray about that. All right. Personal request. Give us our daily bread. Then confessing our sins. Forgive our debts. And it goes back to relationships. Forgive our debtors. Again, the first R of Christianity. Relationships. Forgive our debtors. And then finally, guarding the integrity of our lives. Deliver us from evil. Keep us from evil. That's the model prayer that Jesus has given us. Next slide. And then, believe it or not, God will help you pray. If you ever are in a season of your life when you feel like, I just need to pray, but I don't know what to say. God will help you pray. God will give you the words. All right, you pray, you just start talking to him. And I'm not saying light candles, get on your knee, turn everything off around you. But I, you're driving down the road, turn the radio down. Still, fo Please still focus on where you're driving. But talk to, talk to him like he's riding in the passenger seat beside you. All right, just talk to him. Have a conversation with him. You don't have to bow your head. You don't have to close your eyes. It's, it's a moment between God and yourself. But in Romans 26, 27, Paul tells us that the Spirit will make intercession. Big word again, intercession. All right. What that means is when we can't find the words, God will put them there. Because he knows. He already knows. Next slide. And then he hears every word. That came from Revelation. That's the dark book. 5-8. All right? Look, the creatures and elders, right, they fell down before the Lamb. All right? Each one of them was holding a harp, which at the time, remember, harp were, made the most beautiful music. That's why they were holding a harp. And they were holding a golden bowl. All right, that was full of incense, and that represented the prayers of the saints. So the point is, even if you don't feel connected with God, talk to him because he hears every word. And then overcome temptation. Anybody ever here ever prayed to overcome temptation? It's fine. <laughs> it's perfect. Pray to overcome temptation. Why? Because Jesus prayed to overcome temptation. Look, he was facing what was going to be the worst moments of his life. All right? He knew he was facing the cross. He knew he was facing death. Okay? And what did he do? They were in the garden. His disciples were sleeping. He went off by himself to pray. Three times. Because he knew, he knew to fall back on prayer. Because he knew that prayer would give him the strength to get through what he was facing. And then the final R, redeemed. All right? Redeemed. Redemption, redeemed, redempt. However you want to say it, uh, it has a lot of definitions, a lot. So I chose this one because, to me, it made the most sense of the point I'm trying to make. Uh, it's to compensate for the faults or bad aspects of something, of a person, atone, or make amends for error or evil. 
All right. Y'all, I'm redeemed. Okay, I'm standing here before y'all because I am redeemed. I am not the man that I once was, and I'm so thankful for that. Okay? Um, and I was, I was telling a story. Uh, the first service, uh, years ago, the word redeem meant something totally different to me. Um, it, when I used to think of redeemed, I, I used to think of, I want a second chance at something. I want something, I want to redo, be able to redo something. I want a second chance. And uh, a certain date came to mind. It was December 4th, 1998. Um, it was a Friday night. Uh, it was in Willing. Uh, it was the state championship uh, my sophomore year of high school. Uh, and I, I was telling you know, going up there, uh, we, got, we thought we were going to win. All right? I have never been a part of a football team or, or part of a single football game where we thought we were going to win more than I was at that moment. We just knew. It was, it was DuPont High School's last game uh, ever. They were shutting the school down. Um, and we knew we knew that if we made it to that game, there was no way we were going to lose. Um, matter of fact, we had lost one game that whole year, a regular season game at Nitro High School. We lost to uh, J.R. House, quarterback y'all may have heard of him. Uh, he's now third base coach for the Cincinnati Reds. But he was quarterback, and he actually um, – it was, it was crazy because uh, um, I was second string, so I, I didn't play a lot. Um, well, I, I played a decent amount because we usually were so far ahead, he put JV in. But I remember the, the Nitro game. We were playing J.R. House. And uh, all season long, I mean, he, he broke the national record for passing yards in high school. He's a fantastic quarterback, but he's even a better linebacker. But his senior year at Nitro, they knew he was going to break the record. It was just a matter of when. Well, it just so happened that the game he broke it against was DuPont. Like, I think he needed, going into that game, I think he needed like 57 yards to break the record. So, I mean, we knew it was going to happen. So, I'm standing on the sideline. And our statistician, uh, was, of course, he was keeping his stats. You know. So he said, uh, he said, if he throws a pass on this play right here, he's going to break the record. And it's like four yards is what he needed. So it's like, you know, if he completes the pass, it's going he's going to break the record. So there's like, and, and to be honest with you, it it should have never happened um, because that play should have never happened. It should have never counted because because we had. Like, DuPont had too many men on the field that play because we were all standing on the sideline, and then, like, 15 of us stood, took our foot and put it over the sideline. That way we could say we was on the field when he broke the record. So, we had, we had, like, too many men on the field. But, anyways, we lost that game to a very good Nitro team. I mean, they were very good. They actually ended up winning the, the AAA state championship that year. Um, but... Uh, and after we lost that game, it was like, eh, we won't have to play them anymore. They're a good team. We're okay. We're still in good shape. <clears throat> so we go. We play our, our first playoff game at Laley Field. We're playing Liberty Raleigh. Um, it's 14-7 to at halftime. And um, we're winning 14-7 to at halftime. And their seven points came off of a kickoff return. Coach Whitman was not happy at halftime. He was not happy. So after his little halftime speech he gave us, I think we ended up winning that game 49 to 14 or something. Um, so we, we, we ran away with that one. Then the following week, we're playing East Bank, uh, the quarterfinals that lately. We're the home team because everybody in here knows DuPont's better than East Bank. We're the home team. Uh, and that was a good game. I mean, that was a good game. It was a very, 
back and forth, hard fought, hard fought game. Both teams played really well. Uh, DuPont, of course, won because we're better. But um, that that game, like I don't know if anybody in here was at that game, but it, it was wild. It, it was sold out, like standing room only at Lakeland Field. Okay, DuPont, as far as I know, as of course I could be wrong at this point, but in the same season, DuPont is the only school that I know of that sold out Laidley Field and Willing Island Stadium in the same year. Uh, when we went up to the championship game a couple weeks later, it was standing room only again. Um, but I'm getting sidetracked. But anyways, um, my redemption. We, we end up going, we lose the state championship game. And uh, like, I was distraught. I mean, I was like, you know, we were supposed to win, and it's the last year for the school. I mean, the 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 team, the just the guys on the team, we were so close, uh, and, and we wanted it for each other, but we wanted it for so much more. We wanted it for anybody who's ever played football at Dupont. We wanted it for anybody who's ever went to school at Dupont. We we just we wanted it for the community. Last year, last football game, we wanted it. And of course, we fell short. There was some guy up there we played against named Quincy Wilson. Apparently, he was good. Um, I don't know. Y'all may have heard of him. <laughs> but yeah, he ran for 195 yards in the first half on us. Yeah, he was good. We had, we, we had a good running back, too. Just ours wasn't as good. Uh, but anyways, that that's what, for me, redemption. I wanted, like, honestly, I believe if, if we would have played that game ten times, we'd have beat them nine out of ten. But it was just that one that they got us. Um, and for a long time, that's what redemption meant. I wanted another chance at that. I wanted another chance at that state championship. And I never got it. Um, but now I'm older. I won't say I'm more mature, but I'm wiser. Um, redemption, a whole nother meaning. Next slide. All right. Romans 6, 1 through 14. I didn't go into real big detail about it because it's a big passage. Um, but the power of sin is broken. That's what I titled this one because that's what this passage sums up. All right. Paul explains in this passage that those who belong to Christ have died in sin. All right, that's six twos. Six three. Christians died in sin when they were baptized into Christ. All right. Six six. Your old self was crucified and put to death. The one who has died, meaning who has died with Christ. Okay, that's six seven. Six ten. Died to sin. Jesus died to sin, to take sin upon himself. And then he resurrected to show us that sin has been defeated. All right. And then 614, sin will not rule over you. Okay. Anybody ever here ever done something and then felt bad afterwards? Yeah. Sin does not rule over you. Okay. Sin will not have triumph in the lives of Christians. Take up your cross. All right, Matthew 6, 24 and 25. Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples. Boom. Jesus told his disciples, if you're going to follow me, take up your cross. All right, now today that has a whole new meaning for us than it did for his disciples back then. When Jesus said, take up your cross, the disciples knew what the cross represented. The cross represented the worst punishment imaginable, okay? So his disciples were like, whoa, wait a minute. Like, I want to follow you. Like, you seem like a pretty cool dude, but you want me to take up my cross. All right, what Jesus means is die to yourself to follow him, okay? He, he says it in 25, whoever saves his life, will lose it. But whoever gives his life will save it. Okay. What he's talking about is 
if you live your life for you, you're going to die. You give your life to Jesus, you'll have eternal life. And then sweet redemption. All right, sweet redemption. I put the passages up there. We're going to talk about them. Um, and then if anybody ever wants to, they're, they're up there. You can write them down. Um, in case I don't know what I'm talking about, you can go back and read yourself. Because it happens. Like, it's already August, and, like, I think I've been wrong three times this year already. I mean, it's rare, but it happens. But anyways... Sweet redemption. I'm going to talk about a couple of my favorite redemption stories in the Bible. Um, and I know we all, it, it's easier said than done, all right? The relationship, all right? The running, the running. Would anybody in here ever have a relationship with somebody they didn't talk to? No, you wouldn't. So why do you expect to have a relationship to Jesus? You won't talk to him in running conversations every day. The relationship, the running. And I get it, it's hard sometimes. Just like, like the song the girl sang. Be still, okay? Be still. It's easier said than done. We worry, all right? We have to deal with people on a daily basis. And people were stupid. It's fact. It's in the Bible. People were stupid. Right? The very beginning, he created the world. Then, don't eat fruit. Got it, God. Eve. Hey, look, fruit. Fruit. We have fruit. We have Mark Madison. Timmy knows. Fruit. Crown. Uh, what was it? It is a men's retreat thing. Rod was there. Got the fruit, got the roots, dig the roots, dig the Heart round, heart round. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. But anyways, all right, so Eve's like, hey, look, fruit. So Eve, Eve eats fruit. She's like, hey, Adam, have some fruit. And Adam's like, cool. Wait a minute. Is this a fruit God told us not to eat? And she's like, uh, I don't know, maybe. Uh, so he eats it, because why? He'll do anything for a relationship, right? Even if it means denying God. He wants a relationship. He do it. So boom, they eat the fruit. Oh no, now God's coming. Where's he at? Shh, 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 shh. Keep your mouth shut. Put your leaf on. He's coming. Yeah, boom. I know it didn't happen exactly like that, but it's pretty cool. I read the book. Um, but anyways, my favorite, my couple of my favorite redemption stories. Peter. Peter denies God three times. Jesus tells him. You're going to deny me. No, I'm not. You're homie. I've got your back. We're, we're good. They come to arrest Jesus, right? Throw Jesus to the ground. Peter grabs a sword, cuts the dude's ear off. Jesus glues it back on. All right. Yeah, cool. Um, so then, arrest Jesus. Take him away. Peter's walking through the, the open garden there and warming himself by the fire. Hey, you were with God. No, I don't know that man. Three times. Denied him. All right. Then, how do you think he felt? Heard that rooster crow three times. He told him he was going to. He still said, no, I'm not. And he still did it. All right. So what happens? Jesus dies on the cross after he was beaten badly. Thrown in the tomb. Three days later, he's gone. Where's he at? Mm -hmm. All right. So then Jesus appears to Peter. Right. He's a, he's, they're out on the boat getting fish. And uh, Jesus is on the shore. Peter sees him, realizes it's Jesus, swims to him. They have breakfast. They have a conversation after breakfast. Three times, Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? Three times, Peter says, you know I do. Three times, Jesus tells him, feed my sheep, take care of my flock talking about redemption you was with the man he said you were going to deny him you promised you wouldn't you did <laughs> his prophecy was fulfilled he died he resurrected you got to have a conversation with him 
you are redeemed. And then the, the last one, which is my absolute, like, I just, as many times as I've tried to wrap my mind around it, I, I, all right, Jesus is on the cross, beaten, bloody, got the crown, uh, mocked, humiliated, guy on either side of him. One guy, <laughs> he, he the, the same punishment, being crucified. And while he's being crucified, he's mocking Jesus. If you're really the Savior, save yourself. Get yourself off that cross and get us off with you. You can't do it. And then there's this other guy. What, what was going through his mind? Seeing Jesus. Just pierced, beaten, just horrible. The sights. He sees Jesus. He, he sees those there mocking him. He hears this guy mocking him. What changed in him? There was nothing. Like, this dude did something bad to be crucified. They just didn't crucify anybody. I mean, he did something bad to be crucified, right? There was nothing in his life good he's being crucified alongside Jesus he sees Jesus in this shape he looks down and he sees the pain and the hurt in the mother of Jesus' eyes as she looks up at his son what changed in him remember me when you get to your kingdom is what he said to Jesus as this guy's mocking him what are you doing don't you know this guy's innocent? He does not deserve. You and I deserve what we got. This guy deserves none of this. Remember me when you get to your kingdom. And then Jesus finally says, I assure you, you will be with me. In that moment, the ultimate redemption. And then, and then Jesus says, it's finished. It, it's finished. Okay? 23, 46 in Luke. My Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Whatever it is that you all brought in here with you today, those of you sitting at home watching this, if anybody is, I don't know. You probably heard I was talking, so like there's probably millions of viewers right now. Um, that would be my guess, but like I said, I've been wrong like three times this year already. But whatever it is you have, when you walk out them doors, it's waiting on you. Unless you leave it here. Because you are redeemed. I am redeemed. The ultimate redemption. That guy on that cross beside Jesus, nothing. There's nothing that says he was even an ounce of a good person. But something in him changed at that moment. In his last moments of life. Remember me. Surely you will be with me. It is finished. Everybody bow your heads. Father, we just come to you today, Lord, and just, just praising you, Lord, praising you for what you did, that we are redeemed, Lord, that no matter what has happened in the past, it does not matter, Lord. We are redeemed in you. Your life, your death, our life in you keeps sin away from us, Lord. We are redeemed, and I just pray, Lord, that if anybody in here has not accepted that relationship with you, Lord, or if somebody in here is just, just something's weighing heavy, heavy on them, Lord, we just ask that you just lead them, Lord, lead them to make a decision, Lord, whether it's where they're at, they want to come up here and pray, Lord, just whatever it is, just give them that strength, give them that courage, 
to do what needs to be done. In your name we pray, amen. hearts and minds clear. Danny, would you dismiss us this morning?
Lord, thank you for this. Lord, for the service.